following diagram shows the contents of this biobank. With regard to this project, the question of protecting the personality rights of the individual is entirely unanswered. Also, the Macedonian constitution generally protects the personality rights. It's unclear whether DNA issues are covered. Issues like the informed consent, the duration of storage, etc. are not mentioned. Abusing tissues and data for discrimination purposes with regard to unwanted groups of the population is therefore not excluded. In particular, since until quite recently, Albanian minorities have been persecuted. The second example is the Genographic Project. Within the scope of the Genographic Project, which has the goal to take human genetic samples from all over the world in order to create a world atlas of human migration, this project was announced in April 2005 and is initiated by the National Geographic Society IBM, the geneticist Spencer Wells, and the Wade Family Foundation. Referring to information published on the internet, an advisory board with 10 members provides advice and consultation on matters such as funding, priorities, ethical and legal compliance over the course of the project. This should ensure that all national and international laws concerning human genetic sampling and anthropological research are followed before starting. An external control is managed by the Social and Behavioral Sciences Institute Review Board. Concerning indigenous people, scientists are going to take samples from them. So far, the initiators have not made clear the sampling is how the sampling is to be managed. It is just mentioned very regularly that the participation is voluntary and that advice and counsel from leaders and members of indigenous communities is sought. In regional research labs, the samples are analyzed and encoded results, the encoded results are sent to the central database of the Arizona Research Lab for analysis. The origin of the sample and the donor are kept on file in the regional research lab. Published information states that any further research on the samples and any patenting on the results are banned. The samples are to be destroyed completely by the end of the project. The net proceeds from the sale of the participation kits will be directly towards cultural preservation efforts for participating indigenous populations. According to the lack of transparency in this project, it is not clear if and when consultations with indigenous people concerning the implementation and methodology of the project are to be enacted. The same lack of transparency causes this project to be linked to scientific paternalism. Also, any possible economic exploitation is unknown. Furthermore, the security of the indigenous participants' data is not guaranteed as mentioned above. The respect for human dignity and the respect for the rights of each human being, regardless of their genetic characteristics, and the imperative not to reduce individuals to their genetic characteristics were acknowledged through the UNESCO Universal Declaration on the Human Genome and Human Rights in 1997. For this reason, the mentioned human genetic projects 
are, as I think, violations against agreements under international law, for example, the ILO Convention 169 and the included demand for the participation of concerned peoples in the formulation, implementation and evaluation of plans and programs for national and regional development which may affect them directly. Therefore, the criticism given by the Indigenous Peoples Council on biocolonialism is indeed very much understandable and regards the concern that through the intended genetic analysis with the scope of the genographic project, the integrity and sacredness of the indigenous bodies and their ancestors are violated and as a consequence to this it is problematic to give the project any support. In both of these cases the risks are more or less evident and one should avoid hurting the rules as they are given for these cases. But on the other hand, we also recognize opportunities for anti-discrimination of minorities. And we should use them for the benefit of these groups. I will give you an example for this case as well from Hungary. The background is the following. The ethnic statistics and data protection project was inaugurated in 2000 and directed by the Hungarian Rights Information and Documentation Center. It was funded by the Center for Policy Studies of the Central European University in Budapest. Lawyers worked in the proposing group, human rights activists and NGO representatives as a response to Roma rights lawyers working at and with the European Roma Rights Center who routinely noted that one of the most significant obstacles to effective anti-discrimination litigation was the absence of statistics showing disparate treatment of Roma and other minorities in most areas of public life. <coughs> this group, together with representatives of the Open Society Institute Budapest, the Constitutional and Legal Policy Institutes, and other NGOs, later served as the steering committee of the project. Generally, we have to observe the right to information, and the right to privacy. And this difficulty of reconciling these interests is nowhere more pronounced than in the field of race anti-discrimination. Fundamental to the task of promoting civil rights and non-discrimination through Europe is the accurate documentation of the subordinated position of racial and ethnic minorities in many areas of public life. Statistical information is a prerequisite for the formulation of government policy as well as it could be in the health sector. In spite of this, historical experiences regarding the abusive purposes of statistics mistrust toward the willingness or capacity of governments to maintain confidentiality do still lead to non-cooperation and continue to do so. One of the most important European steps on race anti-discrimination is the adoption of the directive implementing the principle of equal treatment between persons irrespective of racial or ethnic origin by the Council of the European Union in June 2000. And in the future, it will mainly depend on governmental authorities how far they can produce trust in ethnic monitoring, statistics, and the future means of biobanks. So, what do we learn from our race and ethnical data case? 
We must carefully wage the chances and risks for ethnic groups resulting from material and data monitoring. Biobanks as extraordinary means can provide support and also statistical data against anti-discrimination. However, in Germany in particular, we have had bad experience in the history of observing and destroying the Roma and Sinti people. And until the 19th of the last century, we found Roma observations by the police, especially in Bavaria, not to be called Roma monitoring, but Landfahrer, that means vagrant observing. These data perhaps do not exist anymore, but in contrast to our National Ethics Council of Germany and other authors who do not seem to be able to recognize any discrimination of minorities in Germany, I would say we do have these minorities of Roma and Sinti peoples and others and should be very cautious. However, if different interest groups of the civil society and the tissue and data donors themselves do agree. Monitoring should be considered as being useful for anti-discriminating purposes. So, we must follow the rules of the ILO 169. We must arrange public hearings also on the internet for such purposes and projects. And we must especially follow the community consent and the expressed will of potential donors. Ethnic monitoring could be feasible, provided international principles and standards of the ILO are adhered to, as well as further documents concerning the biomedical and genetic research, and provided the effective participation of all stakeholders in public hearings, e.g. concerning the above-mentioned purposes and projects is granted. Nevertheless, the expressed will of the potential donor is considered as an ethical imperative for those projects. Yeah. Thank you very much. For it. To pay $100. All people have to pay $100 and then they get a result. Yes. And the results are stored, but they pay for it. And I think it's an incentive to send samples to this project. And another co sponsor is IBM, in fact. Um, do you have any comments? Or yes, Ali, please. Thank you for your interesting talk. Uh, you mentioned about the need for community consent. I wonder if you provide us any practical uh, definition and a practical mechanism which uh, would be possible to obtain community consent. And actually, I'm concerned about the community of people from one country who lives in another country. For example, if a researcher here finds a community of Iranian people, 10 or 20, and one or two have their uh, samples, would it be okay just to have their own consent? Or what does it mean, community consent in this sense? Thank you. Well, that's a very important and very special question. And uh, it's always the same question in, in all discussions. What is community consent? So, um, I think it's not possible to give you an answer now because it is discussed in different ways and we have different answers. What is community consent? If you take uh, groups in Venezuela, for example, you have another community consent as for a group in India or somewhere else. So I think you have a lot of um, definitions for community consent and it's a never-ending discussion on it. And I really didn't want to give you any incent to discuss it here now because it's not our discussion, it's another one. We, we, we can talk, uh, I think, uh, one week or one month about community consent. <laughs> Any other comments or questions? So I've given you a statement uh, from our group 
Uh, we have discussed this problem in, uh, at the University of Lüneburg and uh, we had sent some representatives to Geneva, to UNESCO meeting there and they have given this statement and uh, it was agreed by all the groups of uh, the participants in UNESCO meeting. I've just distributed it and you have it now also. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Okay. So thank you. Okay. Good afternoon to everybody and um, I, uh, I want to, say, uh, to thank the organizer, especially uh, Darren, for the invitation. I have specified my, t my theme and I would like to talk uh, today about human biobanks, trustees and some aspects of the current dis discussion, especially in Germany. If one observes all factors that concern the organization of a biobank, the aspect of acceptance takes on an exceptional role. Every plan to successfully reorganize a biobank depends on a high level of agreement by all participants. A trusteeship represents an interesting possibility for the organization and, uh, and administration of genetic data. What remains to consider is what kind of uh, trusteeship is appropriate. This often depends on the situation that the initiators of a biobank find themselves in. For example, a private uh, sector uh, private sector trusteeship tries to optimize the profit aspects of research. However, this profit orientation should lead in no manner to neglect of the use of data protection. Uh, there be this danger in the international transfer of data is quite high. Also, the acceptance of all parties concerned is not exactly the rule in the private sector organization. This shows that, uh, this shows that private sector trusteeship is in a field of tension as regard to the common rule. If a public trustee is delegated in administer a, a biobank, can a, a biobank one can assume that at least in the Western, uh, in the Western industry nation, nations, that sufficient cultural measure, uh, measures are guaranteed, and therefore the common rule is not neglected. Therefore, it seems meaningful to strive for a cooperative form of public and private sector tr trusteeship or a commissioned form of a public or private organization. An alternative uh, would be naturally a creditable private organization such as the first genetic trust. On, uh, on October 2003, the German and French Ethic Councils emphasized in a joint statement there must be an overriding authority to supervise compliance with the relevant rules. A, su a suitable model for this role is that of a special delegate or trustee whose function and duties are to determined in detail. Therefore, the views of the Ethic Council are in accordance with the internationally highly esteemed proposal of the introduction of a type of trustee who besides supervising bio-banks would also provide additional legitimacy. The trusteeship uh, could also be organized in different levels of hierarchy this would allow private trusts to join up with, co uh, with co uh, commissions and at a higher level, perhaps with the government. Regardless of what organizational form of trusteeship takes, one of the main functions of, of the trustee is public reports. It's public reports. This includes regular feedback about the commercial utilization and the actual medical benefits resulting from the research with the donor data. If uh, this uh, reporting in involves permanent communication, it leads to increased transparency about, of the, about the work of a biobank and, and therefore 
promotes a general acceptance within the population. The administration of data protection in Germany has provided an exceptional example of such work. This has gained recognition on an international level. To be sure, not all functions required of the trusteeship of biobanks are covered, but the orientation towards the four procedural steps of a biobank, in any case, corresponds that of the already existing data protection. The German data protection system has also been outstanding for its transparency, excellent public relations, and further developments in a legal sense precisely through impetus from their own personnel. This would be an optimal construction in the sense of the con uh, continuity of biobanks in the case of insolvency and other problems if it be could really be relevantly adapted. Uh, biobanks are booming worldwide. However, one should, be, should distinguish between those organizations that uh, collect administer and utilize large amounts of material and data centrally, centrally including life, life science and environmental data. And those who do this on a smaller level, thus are more decentralized, specialized biobank banks. The last are the known in Germany. Wherever this is less a matter of biobanks in the sense of this work, which corresponds to the normal, normally accepted definition, but to rather these are entirely normal material banks constructed according to scientific criteria. I have included this since they can also be connected with other organizations according to the above criteria. Here one is confronted with the problem of an appropriate way of dealing with the phenomenon of biobanks in order to be able to meet the challenge of the balancing the inherent challenges and risks. This is especially true in the sense of a better healing of illnesses on the one hand with the concomitant risks for the concerned above all the patients and the possible discrimination of an entire population group on the other hand. This potential threat is treated in this work not only in a general sense and for Germany more specifically, but also treated in detail in international comparison. Therefore, it is also more important to broaden the perspective for the protection and the utilization of biodata in the Federal Republic of Germany and the European Union. However, it is not implied in the above statement that one should curtail the requirements for consent of the extraction of body substances. It is merely a matter how, as in a National Ethic Committee, uh, National Ethic Council formulated it, in consideration of the public interest, research is, uh, is to take precedence above the personal interest of the donors to decide over the fate of their body substances and data. Therefore, this concern precisely the further research of substances separated from the donor body where the donor has no specific lasting interest in the user of and without his declared consent. This carte blanche authority would be primarily relevant to completely anonymous samples and data, and especially for material without relevance for individuals. Consent should be obtained in any case for the external utilization of human samples and data. In agreement with the National Ethics Council, the utilization thereof in exceptional cases should be possible without consent where there is a predominant scientific interest in the research goal and if the purposes or purpose of the research cannot be reached in any other manner. That means 
that in this case, to a degree, the direct connection to a concrete research project must be abandoned. Similarly, the principle of mandatory destruction of personal data after the end of certain time, as required by the German data protection law, must be given up. However, in the case of transmission to a third party, the samples must either be made completely anonymous or at least be encoded. In this context of personal consent, transmission of the stored samples and data plays a role as far as the legal successor to the biobank is concerned. Furthermore, in the case, the permission of the donor in, is, a, uh, is a sine qua non unless the samples data are made anonymous. As mentioned above, the trust model, model uh, with its various forms of private, private public and purely public cooperative efforts are being tested at the moment. One should especially mention patient collectives here who administer and utilize the samples and data themselves. But one should also mention purely private corporations, such as the First Trust in the United States. In Germany, the Ombudsman, uh, the Ombudsman is discussed as a model for supervision of biobanks. This, in, in the shape of a variety of forms, is quite a success model. The model of an administrator, uh, as this case of the data protection officials, who is autonomous in his power, would be a good export for the rest of Europe in order to, um, in order to formulate competing rules and com uh, committing measures for the protection of the donor. To be sure, the data protection laws already foresee the use of data protection pers uh, personal so that uh, the rule does not have to reinvent re it. The use of commercial organizations lent to the government is just as conservable as civic organizations. In both cases, supervision is necessary to ensure that the balance is struck between private and public interests. In this sense, the question arises as to whether in the framework of the plant genetic test law, more consideration should be taken regarding research by individuals. Such regulations are urgently required for the realization of the perspective of the utility of a biobanks and the control of risks. This applies not naturally also to an intensive discussion in the, about the possibility restrictions of data protection in regard to carte blanche authorization as stated above. Unfortunately, such discussion has barely started in Germany. The CITIC examples show clearly that the discussion in Germany has begun just recently and so far is not as thrilling as well as the example in the US, Iceland, Estonia, and the UK, Canada, or in the Scandinavian uh, countries. The need to catch up is extremely serious because one needs public discussion of, uh, of this matter in order to protect the right of citizens, advance the utility of the biobanks, and to avoid a negative public feeling arising, for example, the case of the green engineering. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Do we have any questions? Questions? So I'd like to ask uh, Bridget her opinion on the genographic project. Do you agree? Um, it is against norms of international law? Uh, yeah. Yes, I, I think in, in some cases here in Zimmer I are uh, several times fighting about this topic because um, we have a special of, uh, idea of, uh, of a, a, a group consent form and I think this is also a possibility to misuse the indigenous people for, uh, for politics. So um, uh, I think uh, in, I dislike actually this kind of consent because I prefer more also in this group uh, more an individual consent. Yes? 
But so it was really unfair because I told you yeah. not only community yes, consent, I know, which I is know. indeed very difficult. Yeah. And as I just told before, it is a big discussion on community consent. But also the role of the donor is the most important thing. I know, I know. It and so also discussions in internet about such projects. So what are you telling here about my opinion? <laughs> this, uh, this was the last opinion after our last discussion and you have, have changed something. No, no. <laughs> Interaction. Um, any other comments? Yes, sir, share it, please. Such human biobanks in developing nations. Um, I, th I think uh, the, uh, for developing uh, countries it can be interesting to have uh, such a biobank, uh, but before to, uh, establishing, I think, uh, for example, like India, it is important to have legal rules how to handle it and how to provide the information. If you see the Indian law, for example, you have also a data protection law, and uh, uh, but uh, I know um, or I have a feeling better, better and uh, some impressions that in, for example, in the medical field, uh, this law is not really well known and also not known in the in the case of uh, of uh, 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 gathering the genetic information. It's, it was uh, it was established. Uh, I remember '86, and it uh, it was focused on the IT sector. And uh, in a lot of cases, I think there is a lack between the different. Uh, fields in India to, um, to, uh, to recognize uh, the existing law. India has a lot of uh, protection, also law, but it, if, uh, but it is not still working because nobody knows it. And I think in this case it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a good thing to uh, establish something uh, like, a, like a biobank to um, have also the possibility to uh, do something for the local community because I'm not against uh, the biobanks, but it's, but, uh, it's, it's very important uh, to have proper legal rules and not only to have it, uh, to use it. Okay. Well, thank you very much, and uh, you can have a well-earned afternoon tea. Um, I'd just like to, um, well, I think that's all. Just if, if any speaker, there's only four left, if they haven't given the PowerPoints, please to give those. Okay, thank you. So I'm a member of the International Bioethics Committee of UNESCO, and we'll talk on some thoughts about implementation of international bioethics declarations in Vietnamese pat practice. Thank you. First of all, I would like to thank UNESCO and uh, Dr. Massa for giving me a chance to be here with you. So good after tea. Uh, my topic is some issues, only some issues, in implementation of international bioethics declarations in Vietnam practice. the current national priorities now. After many years of wars, even now the wars cannot be counted. The country and nation concentrate their efforts on three things. First, development of economy, reform of education system, improvement of health care. And to do this, we apply the achievements of modern science and technology. One of them is biotechnology. That's why, at the moment, in Vietnam, at least some bioethical issues are sometimes, and in some extent, considered luxuries. And it is one of the difficulty for us to introduce <laughs> bioethical principles to Vietnam practice now. Uh, yes. So I would like to describe some 
characteristics of Vietnam practice from the view of bioethics. Firstly, we have now some government decrees and regulations on bioethics. Since 1980s, we have official regulations allowing free abortion. Maybe because of this, Vietnam has now one of the highest abortion rates in the world. One per seven abortion per woman in a year. And this also aiming at to reduce the population of Vietnam and to increase income of population. The second is government decree on 15 February 2003 on human cloning. The details I will show you later on. And quite recently, our government issued in August 2005 the regulations on genetically modified organism. And this is not only for safety, for safe use of GMO, but also aiming at economy purposes. For example, for for export our agricultural products. Uh, some other degree on organ transplantation to be published in near future. The second characteristic is the lack of bioethic courses in most of schools. Nowadays in our country we have only medical ethics courses in medical universities, in medical schools for doctors. We also lack some many other bioethical regulations. For example, the regulations on uh, genetic data, the regulations on uh, uh, research and use of stem cells. So this, these are some details of one degree. Uh, one degree, yes. The Vietnam government decrees on uh, February 2003 banning human cloning. But only with reproductive purposes. The cloning, the human cloning with uh, purposes of therapy should be allowed. The recent dec decree from government on genetically modified organism. In this decree, uh, we describe some regulations on the research use and transfer of GMO. Some parts, I think we can see here that we can import GMOs from outside. If this kind of GMOs have been used in the export country. <coughs> so this is the some characteristics of Vietnamese society uh, from the view of bioethics. Now I would like to present some items concerning two international bioethics declarations which have some difficulties to be implemented in Vietnamese practice. First, it is international declaration on human genetic data. The second, universal declaration on bioethics and human rights to be issued, I think, in the very near future. It 
in International Declaration, Declaration on Human Genetic Data, uh, I would like to focus on one item. It is consent. Consent uh, is covering two articles on this declaration. The Article 8, Article 9, and Article 10. I have to say that the authors of this declaration are very skilled, very smart, and are very careful so that they have covered almost all aspects and items concerning consent. But for Vietnam practice, something lacked. of biological samples. In the other side are researchers or physicians or scientists. Do not pay any attention on issuing consent except some very rare cases. So I can I would say that all people keep silent about the consent. I do not say about medical consents, because medical consents is something different from bioethical consent. I mean bioethical consent. <coughs> so, on, in uh, all three articles of the declaration, uh, the authors do not uh, see the, uh, this difficulty <coughs> that nobody in the country pay attention do, or do not care about the consent. For the second declaration on bioethics and human rights to be published as, um, as you know soon, I would like to talk only about the Article 3 on human dignity and human rights. In this article there are two paragraphs. The first one, human dignity, human rights and fundamental freedoms are to be fully respected. This paragraph have no problem with Vietnamese society. The second one, the paragraph B, the interest of welfare of the indi individual should have priority over the sole interest of science in society. Uh, as we were educated in our country, as in, as in other countries before called socialist ones, only we have to put individual profit under the collective profit. Yeah. And that's why this paragraph is very, very difficult to be accepted in our society. Yeah. And which is right declaration of, of Vietnam. I would say at the moment I cannot say who is right. For example, for example, nowadays in Vietnam we have fifty percent absolutely absolutely healthy children among nutrition 
our malnutrition. 50%. Yeah. Even we have economy developing very fast for 10 years already. And nowadays, still 50% completely healthy, healthy children are malnutrition. So, that's why our priority must be must be to have food enough, nutrition enough to make this fifty percent healthy. Yeah. This must this must be priority number one. And number two to feed and to uh, give birth uh, disabled children. This must be priority number two for Vietnam. Yeah. Certainly for uh, good, for high intra industry countries, maybe the priorities are different. But for Vietnam, it is. So, which approach should we take now? Uh, we realize the nature of current status of biotics, not only in our country, but in many other developing countries. It's the same. Which is the gap, the gap between the priorities. The difference between the priorities. And for bioethics, for global bioethics, in my understanding, almost the same nature of current status. Which, which, which is, uh, what is the nature? In my understanding, nowadays we are talking a lot and very often about bioethics because some bi biological sciences are rapidly developing and reaching very, very big achievements which are applicable very fast to practice. And from other side, we, we have, I would say, rather static, static, ethical principles born or set up in the history, in the long history, and are not developing at all. This is in my understanding, maybe my understanding is wrong, but I understand the, the issue the point in such a way. So, to solve the problem between the fast developing science technologies and the static ethical principles, the first thing we should do is improvement of basic scientific knowledge for the public, for community in our country. <coughs> so let's people know about the sciences and technologies which can be, can contribute to our economy development. Yeah. And the issues may cause some ethical debates. And the second thing which we should do is introduce is to introduce bioethical principles to community, including regular courses in schools. I mean, not only in the universities, but also in uh, the secondary schools. We should organize regular public seminars and media programs on bioethics. And the next thing is encourage encouraging bioethical public debates 
an opinion exchange between community, between community in uh, different religions and scientists. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, comments? Uh, yes, young one, please. Uh, you, you talk about, uh, and thank you for your uh, very good uh, presentation. Um, I'm here. <laughs> Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, from your uh, presentation, you talked about uh, no even consent um, be paid uh, attention now in the research. Really? Uh, uh, in medical field. Yes, yes. So in, in research. In research. Yeah, yes. so, so I wonder how, you, how your country uh, selected the uh, human subject. If who want to do research? Yeah, for example, when patients come into the hospital, uh, doctors, medical doctors can take samples from them for testing. Yeah, for testing maybe for diseases, for some diseases they are interested in, and after what, uh, the doc doctors can use this data for their uh, thesis for PhD thesis, but no consent met here. And the patients do not pay any care, any concern about the fate of their uh, genetic information. Because they have no knowledge about this. Yeah. Mm, thank you. Other questions or comments? Uh, yes, uh, okay. I heard uh, in Vietnam uh, Article 3 is uh, discussing on human dignity. Did it? Article 3. Article 3. What is the uh, article number is discussed? I listen to article, article number. Yeah, thank uh, you. Article 1. Yeah, article thank 1. You. Yeah, thank you. Uh, dignity understood in Vietnam as for whole nation and on f not for only one individual. In the case, if, if there is some uh, contradiction between individual and nation as a whole. Thank you. As far uh, as I remember, article number one, the number one is human dignity is only Germany. Germany. German is a constitution given to gazette the article eins is human dignity. In Japan, Kenya, Emperor. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> the dignity in our country is respected. It's respected. But in the case in between the in the case in between one individual in the nation as a whole, some contradiction. We have to respect the dignity for the whole nation. Yeah. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, you said some government uh, decrees on bioethics uh, were made. Uh, I wonder if they were just uh, uh, Thank you. Uh, firstly, the government decree is issued by government, but before that, we have the whole process lasting months or even years for setting up the content of the, of the decree. For example, the decree I, I, I mentioned here about GMO, 
I was involved to form the bakery for two years. And during these two years, we, we had a lot of meetings. And even sometimes we have to finish the meeting at middle of night yeah, in the office. So, uh, was it passed in the parliament? Sorry? Was it passed in the parliament? I, I don't know. <laughs> I'm sorry, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, I, I know that the decree was issued already by government, but was the decree on the parliament? Uh, I don't know. Maybe I, <laughs> I didn't hear about this. Yeah. <laughs> and the second question concerns GMO. NGO. NGO. Yes, yes, yes. Are they opposed by the government? By oh, 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 you see, I am one of the active member of one NGO. Yeah, because I found this NGO, and you can find this in the website. Uh, NGO are still not very strong in Vietnam society and have very little influ influence to all government uh, decrees. Yeah, and Vietnamese and NGO now uh, are not interested yet, mostly in biotechnology. Yeah, only in other uh, branches of economy. UNESCO for the opportunity to be here <coughs> today. Uh, I thought the first thing I should clarify is uh, since I use uh, everyday bioethics in uh, inverted quotes again, I should say a bit about that. Uh, and uh, this brings me to uh, Giovanni Berlinga, uh, who I think many of you know um, uh, is a professor of medicine at uh, La Sapienza University in uh, Rome. Uh, he's also one of the co-authors of the uh, uh, IBC draft, okay, on the possibility of a universal bioethics. <coughs> he had written a book, I think, about a couple of years ago on uh, bioethics, health, and in inequality. Thing. And uh, last year, I think, just about a year ago, he published an article in Lancet, uh, which uh, pretty much summarized, again, the, uh, the salient points, again, of the book. And I uh, lifted a couple of paragraphs, again, from that Lancet article. Thing. So that article says, uh, frontal bioethics has been focused almost exclusively on recent developments in uh, biomedical sciences, for instance, in organ transplantation, genetic therapy, <coughs> cloning, use of stem cells, pre-implantation diagnosis, and transgenic technologies, which lead to unheard of events and new moral categories. Everyday bioethics less remote from the experience of ordinary people concerns the daily persistent conditions of most of the world's population often difficult and sometimes tragic. If we consider common behaviors and knowledge even among people who ignore the latest progresses of science, we can state that moral reflections on birth, gender relations, justice and, and autonomy, disease and healthcare, the independence of species and death have a very long history as long as that of humanity. These reflections guide today, wittingly or unwittingly, the decisions of all individual social groups and communities because it must be shown that all men and women are philosophers by defining the limits and characteristics of spontaneous philosophy which is proper to anybody. And I believe it took this quote from Antonio Gramsci. Um, okay, let me ask. Two years ago, uh, I was uh, asked to join a panel at the uh, International Convention of Asian Scholars in uh, Singapore. Eh? a uh, panel on um, ethical issues in emerging biomedical technologies. So I explained to uh, Broker Schmidt today, who was convening the panel, that I was neither an ethicist nor a bench scientist again. So I propose to speak about uh, uh, ethical issues again in emerging infectious diseases again. Uh, a few months after that, uh, Peter Singer and his colleagues again, uh, published an article in British Medical Journal, of course this was in the uh, few months aftermath of the SARS epidemic, uh, discussing some uh, issues of public health ethics again in the management of infectious outbreaks, emergent outbreaks, uh, drawing 
on the experience of Toronto, which was, of course, many of you know, one of the cities uh, where where SARS okay, had a pretty dramatic uh, outbreak. Okay? So the issues that were discussed by Singh and his colleagues included when officials can publicly identify people who may be spreading an infectious disease, when mass quarantine policies are defensible, whether healthcare workers have a duty to treat patients despite risk to themselves, a shutdown of healthcare facilities and services which is required by an outbreak control protocol, which affect other patients' access to healthcare, especially those with life-threatening conditions. Now, my presentation in Singapore okay, at the International Convention of Asian Scholars, okay, I suggested that uh, some additional issues okay, that one might consider okay, as an area of public health ethics okay, uh, include the following. In, just as we have, uh, by analogy, with the informed consent in a clinical setting or even a research setting, see, we might also speak of informed consent in, consent in uh, public health communications, again, the management of outbreaks, infectious outbreaks, again. Secondly, quality and hospitalization are risk factors. One of my friends, again, who is a practicing public health medicine in Hong Kong, they told me that, uh, but it's based on uh, I don't know how well documented information is, okay. but uh, almost anecdotally mentioned that out of the people who were uh, on whom quarantine was uh, enforced, okay, whether in uh, healthcare institutions or in residential uh, establishments such as the, the Amoy Gardens uh, complex, okay, possibly up to about 80 to 85 of those people okay, who had those very non-specific uh, SARS-like symptoms actually were not in, were likely not infected again. Okay. So there's a clearly uh, an ethical issue there okay, of uh, forcing people to be in an environment where they actually face increased risk okay, of being infected again okay, by uh, uh, life-threatening pathogen. Okay. Thirdly, offloading professional model risk onto public sector staff. And I believe this, uh, con this situation was not confined to Malaysia. I think in practically all the countries okay, that face uh, a uh, dramatic outbreak, okay, uh, the, uh, the burden okay, of uh, managing the outbreak okay, in a clinical setting, or, uh, in particular in the clinical settings, okay, was offloaded onto the public sector staff. Okay. Now, in the case of Malaysia, okay, some of you are familiar with the uh, Malaysian health system. One of the most uh, critical problems is the, uh, not so much that we don't, we're not spending excessively on healthcare, it's just about 2% GDP see, in the public healthcare sector. See. But the more serious problem is a constant outflow of a senior experienced staff okay, from the public sector to the private sector because of very large uh, differences in remuneration. Okay. And uh, if this kind of situation continues, okay, you can expect an acceleration okay, of that uh, perennial hemorrhage okay, of the staff from the public to the private sector. And lastly, okay, and this, this is the issue which I will spend the rest of my presentation speaking on, the patent claims arising from publicly funded research in okay, global. Yeah. So patenting the SARS coronavirus. Okay. Uh, okay, here's uh, something from the May 24th issue of Lancet, okay? just about a month after the uh, WHO declared a global alert. Okay? on SARS. Okay. Within six weeks after declaring a global SARS alert, an international effort coordinated by WHO swiftly identified and sequenced the SARS coronavirus in a remarkable collaboration between otherwise highly competitive laboratories, Asia, Europe, North America. This early change exchanges, however, very soon gave way to a mutual wariness okay, at the point when intellectual public claims were filed for the pathogen sequences and other patentable findings with commercial potential. Okay. Further progress in science research may, may not have to contend with the restrictions and secrecy dictated by proprietary and commercial values. There's one additional point which I'll just mention in passing right now, which I'll elaborate upon later, and that is that uh, the uh, the uh, coming and the waning of the SARS epidemic is actually occurred again okay, well before the availability of reliable diagnostics, therapies, efficacious therapies again, okay, or, um, or vaccines again, okay, which is an uh, interesting commentary okay, on the, the role, contribution, significance okay, of uh, modern biomedical technologies okay, in the management of uh, infectious uh, diseases. Okay, uh,